Hello and welcome to the Winter Park Chamber of Commerce webinar series. My name is Tiffany Cahill and I'm the events manager at the Winter Park Chamber. We are so thrilled that you're able to join us, whether it's via Zoom, via our Facebook live feed, or if you're watching on demand on YouTube or on our website after the fact, welcome. Um, if you would like to start off by engaging in some virtual networking, you can do so by introducing yourself in the chat box. That can be found as you hover over the bottom of your screen. You'll have a bunch of icons that pop up. Click that chat icon and you can introduce yourself and let us know who you're with there. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, feel free to do so in the comment section below. We do have time for audience submitted questions at the end. So if you do have any questions that you would like to share, please feel free to do so in that Q&A feature. Um, if you are on Zoom or on Facebook, you can drop that in the comments as well. Without further ado, I will go ahead and get us started by introducing the Winter Park Chamber President and CEO, Betsy gardner Eckbert. Betsy, welcome. Hi, Tiff. Thanks so much for the introduction and welcome to all of you. We are thrilled to be engaging with you via webinar and we have a special treat today because we have a trustee an actively engaged member of the chamber who helps guide us with some of our financial decisions internally and I know as a resource throughout the community. It is our mission at the Chamber of Commerce to convene people and ideas for the benefit of our businesses and our community and we are thrilled to be able to continue to bring you all together as we move through uh, more and more stages of the COVID-19 reality that we all live in. And today we are especially um, treated to Jason Edwards of Edwards Financial Services. He's gonna be talking to us about the stock market uh, and the ups and downs and how to manage in crazy times. Jason is the managing partner of Edwards Financial Services. He was named in 2009, the Orlando Business Journal's Executive of the Year. Under his guidance, Edwards Financial Services has been ranked as one of the largest financial planning firms in Central Florida for over six years and boasts nearly 3,200 clients. Edwards Financial Services was also recently awarded the top M&A advisory firm in the state of Florida, as well as one of the top NABCAP advisement firm, investment firms for 2012. Mr. Edwards has been a regular guest on both radio and television programs. He has the privilege of serving as chairman of the Lake Nona Business Alliance and currently serves on the board for the World Trade Center Organization and supports other local nonprofit organizations like the Disability Chamber of Commerce. Today, he looks to the financial future with optimism and a strategic forward-looking blueprint for success. Jason, welcome, and we are looking forward to your advice for staying sane in a crazy market. Well, thank you, Betsy, and thank you, the Chamber, for having us. We look forward to it. Appreciate it. Appreciate well, all your hard work, too. Oh, thank you. We, we do well as a team. We've got great trustees. We've got great board and a great team, and we certainly appreciate your consistent investment in the Chamber. You know, I'm looking at my own stock portfolio, and it's, it's reminding me of an amusement park. We're going up and down a lot lately, so I think this is a very timely conversation and this is kind of an obvious question to start with but how has COVID-19 impacted the investing um, and stock market world? Walk us through that a little bit if you will. Well that's a great question and, and back to your analogy of a um, roller coaster one of the biggest things that get people scared is fear right they get nervous about it but the reality is the ride eventually ends and they get off the ride and they go on with their day. So that same scenario has happened with the market. We've seen a lot of volatility We've seen a lot of emotion. And I always tell people that there's a lot more emotion than facts driving some of the things we see. And if we don't believe that, think about the fact that we have a, a pandemic that's a respiratory illness and the first thing we ran out of was toilet paper. So that tells you that there's a lot of emotion driving the market too. So it has impacted the market somewhat, but if you had a sound strategy, and we've all witnessed this, especially like with your 401k statement and everyone else's, the market has already rebounded dramatically. Uh, however, there are some areas that you want to be scared and concerned about, and there are some areas that you may want to take a defensive positioning in. But overall, we had a very strong economy. We know that. I mean, jobless numbers were lower than ever. Unemployment was lower than ever. This was not a financial issue, unlike previous market corrections. This was really something that was induced by a sickness, uh, an unexpected illness that no one saw coming. 
So, and, and walk us through a little bit of how the pandemic has actually impacted businesses, either ones you're familiar with for both near or far. Right. Well, it's funny. The pandemic has had a twofold effect. It's been industries that have been hit the hardest. And we know that there are some here in Orlando and Central Florida, like hotels, tourism, sports events, bars, restaurants. Uh, but there's other industries that have just been phenomenal. Anything tech related, for example, what are we using right now? We're on a computer, right? We're on a web-based oh, platform, right? Yeah. I, so, I mean, Zoom, yeah, Zoom and GoToMeeting and WebEx and Microsoft Teams, coupled with the com companies that generate computers. I mean, think about how many people went out and bought new laptops or bought the latest headsets or bought the latest microphones. And then the other thing is, is the virtual-based businesses. Um, what you've seen is companies, and the Winter Park Chamber is a great example. Here's a service that traditionally was, hey, let's have a cocktail hour, let's meet and greet, let's meet businesses one-on-one. -on -one. How do you morph in this environment? So the ones that have been um, agile and the ones that have really adapted their model to use the internet, to use the web-based formats have done very well. We as a firm, for example, you know, we have clients in 18 states. So we were already using a lot of our web-based models and now it's become priceless for us because clients still wanna to talk to you, they wanna see you. Uh, so you've got sectors that have done very well and then you've got areas that have not done so well that could be impacted if this goes on longer. And do you have, maybe you don't want to give us specifics, but do you have favorite companies that you feel like are really outshining or maybe outstripping expectations um, as we move through this? Yeah, I, I would say that industries, because again, obviously I want you to hire us and then we'll help even further, but industries that you see everyday usage or considered essential have done very well. I mean, think about grocery stores, you think about pharmacies, you think about those resources, you also see industries that have popped up overnight as resources like Instacart and other things that people never used five months ago. So there are sectors. However, I would be careful investing in something that might have popped up for a specific need because once that need is gone, what happens to that industry? So there are parts of the industry though that I think are gonna stay around for a long time. You know, We're seeing a lot of companies now that are rethinking their bricks and mortar opportunity. They're thinking, well, wait a minute, we don't need 25 buildings. We may be able to downsize and go to two to three. So there are some incredible opportunities. I mean, you've got investment positions this year alone that are up 43% in some of the portfolios that we manage. So there's a lot of money still being made in spite of this craziness because there is opportunity wherever there is kind of a, a situation that changes. Well, and with that initial correction that we got kind of that March, April period gave everybody a heart attack, but we're starting to see that there are ways to actually make money in this type of market. Can you walk us through what, what opportunities and ways we could make money in this market if there are any? In your well, there's some, yeah, there's some basic things I think everybody, particularly your viewers should look at if they're small businesses. First of all, there has been a tremendous amount of liquidity offered to the small business community, although it's been challenging in some cases, right? You have the, the triple P plan, you have the SBA DL plan. Those are revenue opportunities of capital that help them keep their employees employed. But now from an investment perspective, um, remember the mutual fund or the stock or the individual investment, if it was a good investment, that's critical, if it was good, uh, didn't change overnight. In February, they didn't have incredible earnings and all of a sudden they fell apart, so now they're worth less. That was a lot of fear. And now we see those same mutual funds starting to rebound. So there are sectors and areas that I think your clients should really be looking at. Another strategy, once of course they have cash on hand to protect themselves, uh, is doing something on a monthly basis. We tell clients this all the time. You just described it. The market has gone up and down dramatically over the last four months. Well, if you were buying a little bit throughout those months, it's called dollar cost averaging, you stood to make a lot of money. And we see the market continually going up. I mean, unemployment rate at its highest was at 14.5%. Now it's dropped to 10. And every month it's getting better. So there are incredible opportunities. The biggest challenge, I think, for clients is to not allow fear to dictate policy, but also make sure they're sitting down with their professional, whoever that is, and getting some sound guidance on what areas, because there are areas in the market that are getting destroyed, but there are other areas within the market that are doing incredibly well. So we've talked a little bit about opportunity and I'm thrilled to hear that you think there is still plenty of opportunity in the market. Let's talk about some things that maybe we should be concerned with uh, in the short term future of the economy. So the biggest challenge facing this economy right now, to be frank, is the political environment. 
Um, in the past, we never really worried as, as economists, individuals that manage money, we didn't really worry much about government because they were so polarized, they never did anything. So we could just manage money, companies build their wealth, and the, and the government kept fighting over little things. But now you've got dramatic political shifts. So depending on the outcome of the election in November, that would be my biggest concern to the expansion or contraction of the economy, uh, depending on policy or what I consider viewpoint differences. If you've got one viewpoint over another, that can have a big impact on things like trade, big impact on infrastructure, uh, capital infusion into the, con the country, and also the reemergence of certain manufacturing sectors. I, I sort of negated that, but we'll get into a little bit earlier. There's incredible areas in this country that are exploding now that didn't exist, you know, four or five years ago. So, and let's think about maybe some bright spots for the future of the national economy. I know we talked a little bit about our local economy. Mm -hmm. Tell us where we may have some opportunities uh, from an American perspective. So, so that's a great question. And, and I think a lot of people get, you know, the good information gets drowned out by all the negative because that sells. But there's some incredible things going on. So, for example, the, the, the recent trade changes with uh, Mexico and Canada, people may not realize what that did to the economy. But, for example, the dairy farmers up in the Midwest, they now can sell milk to Canada. People don't realize that because of regulation and oversight and trade agreements, they didn't have that resource. Now you're talking about a massive influx of capital coming to a farming grouping that was overlooked and that was being under, undercut by other countries. Um, with the emergence of this pandemic came across opportunity now where we're looking at ways to maybe manufacture our drugs here in this country. So many people may be familiar with last week, Kodak, the big filmmaker, got billion dollars grants from the government. And the reason for that was is because the Rochester plant could be refitted now to manufacture antibiotics. So now you're gonna have a reemergence of healthcare in the United States we never had. 90 plus percent of our, our pharmaceuticals were built overseas. But now with this scare, it's woken up the country to say, hey, wait a minute, we've got opportunity. Let's start manufacturing here so we're not so reliant. So I see a lot of positive things for the economy from an economics perspective. If we continue this mentality of capitalizing on what we saw our weaknesses and then expanding, you've got tremendous growth and great, great opportunity from a GDP perspective. Well, that's great news to hear. And I think I know the answer to this question, but um, I, I, I think you would answer, you want everybody to come make an appointment with you and sit down with you um, to think about what the opportunities could be. But what should we all be doing to properly position ourselves to take advantage of these opportunities in a really uncertain environment? Because we have talked a lot about opportunities, but there still is a load of uncertainty out there, as you accurately point out with the political scene uh, certainly yeah. changes in manufacturing and just sort of geopolitical uncertainty throughout the world. Um, what can our viewers do to take steps to sort of properly position themselves without that? Well, yeah, the last market correction, which was the most severe, also shows us something that they're not long term. They never last more than a couple of months. So the first thing we always tell our clients is make sure you have enough cash on hand to deal with the what ifs. What if you lose your job? What if you lose revenue? We always recommend to have at least six months of your bills saved. So sit down, figure out what your monthly expenses are, and then look at your savings. And do you have six months prepaid? If you don't, don't think about investing. You really need to think about building that first because that's where the stress of making an unwise decision comes from when you have to have money now to pay the car note or to pay the apartment or the house. Once you have that in place, then figure out every month what you could allocate towards your investment and figure out the time window. So there's always two time windows. One is, well, I'm going to retire in 20 years. So that's a different time horizon versus in three years, I may want to go on vacation. Four years, I may want to buy a new car. And then your investment strategy needs to fit that window. But if anything, if you know, history tells us anything, uh, don't get exhausted and don't get emotionally driven by the market because we see how cyclical it is and how much it up and down and capitulates. But if you cover those three bases, um, which is the savings, figure out your window, and then come up with a consistent dollar amount to put in every month, I think you will be pleasantly surprised and you'll have less emotion, less stress when you see these kind of fluctuations. So we do have a couple of questions coming in. I'm, I see one and then I'm gonna have Tiffany help us with some of the other ones and then we'll come back to some kind of some closing thoughts, but it's great to see that we've got some engagement already. Uh, Khalid Manir is asking us, the stock market and the real estate market are defying logic. What are the factors driving them? 
Great question. Good to see you, Khalid. Uh, I've, I've known Khalid for a couple of years. He's in a different area, so it's nice to see he's around. Um, so that, that's a unique situation. So the stock market is being driven by the fact that there is so many robust, robust positive pieces of information. Um, if you look at the market on a granular level, you'll see that the value side of the market is not doing well. The growth side of the market is doing well. And then you go even more deep and you'll see there's specific sectors. I think the real estate market is defying it because there was so much inventory bottled up and this pandemic hit overnight. So you had a lot of mortgages that were already on the books, a lot of housing that was being closed. I would be concerned with the real estate market because traditionally the real estate market has a correction roughly every 10 years, as Khalid will probably attest to. And the other thing I concern myself on the real estate market is the fact that some of these forbearances or people losing their jobs, that hasn't had a chance to play out yet. So there might be a great opportunity for people buying something a couple of months down the road. Um, the equities market though, again, there are sectors that are very insulated against this. You, you talked about Zoom or some of these tech sectors. Regardless of what happens, companies need to produce. They need to figure a way to reach audiences and look what we're doing today. Okay, so Tiffany, I think we've got a couple of people with hands raised. Would you be able to help us with calling on them? Absolutely, so we have uh, Patrick, uh uh, Cornier, who has raised his hand. Patrick, I'm going to unmute you on my end. If you unmute yourself, you should be able to ask your question. Hi, this is uh, Patrick Knoyer. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, I think the biggest concern I have with my portfolio is more so not the political environment in the US-China relations, is the corporate bankruptcies that will be occurring in the next six to 12 months. Okay, so is there is a question regarding that, Patrick? Yeah, I mean, what, what's your feeling? Because there's a lot of, I see a lot of corporate bankruptcies that are becoming, coming down the pike, and that means a lot of people will be losing their jobs. And yeah. as much as the treasury can, um, put money into the market, there's nothing that can overcome that happening. So, so that's a, yeah, that's a great question, Patrick. Um, there's two ways you could insulate yourself somewhat against that, okay? So one example would be how you invest. So to illustrate, instead of buying individual equities, you might wanna look at mutual funds. Now, why do we wanna do that? Patrick, it sounds like you're a pretty educated investor, but mutual funds typically, as you know, own hundreds of companies, right? So the likelihood of all hundreds of companies going bankrupt at the same time would somewhat protect you against that component. Okay. Um, the secondary component, I would say, is the possibility of bankruptcies. I think the bankruptcy component is less likely, but I do agree with you on the jobless claims, uh, because once the subsidies wear off, if these companies haven't adapted to the new environment, meaning they haven't figured out how do I sell deli sandwiches online, or how do I get people to watch movies online, like the movie industry, they are going to downsize. You're absolutely right. Um, the positive on that, I would say, though, is remember, our unemployment was only at 3%. So there are going to be a lot of other sectors that are going to be looking to hire people. So I think there may be a short-term hangover, as you described. But if the economy and the policies we talked about as it relates to manufacturing and other resources do stay in effect, there are going to be other sectors looking for qualified employees. Does that make sense, Patrick? Yes, thank you. Okay, my pleasure. Thanks, that was a great question. And it looks like those are all the questions we have um, for Jason. Well, that was easy. Maybe Khalid's got his hand up. Would Khalid Manir like to ask a follow-up question? It looks like he's got his hand up on my end. I don't know if that's right or not. Khalid, I have uh, allowed you to talk. If you unmute yourself, you should be able to. Can you hear me, Jason? Yes, I can, sir. How are you? I'm doing great, good to see you again. Good to see you. Uh, a quick question, Jason, and that is the, 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 the stock market and the real estate market, they, they seem to be defying logic uh, right now. Because when you start looking at the economic fundamentals, unemployment, 25% uh, of the business is already closed down, they won't be opening back up again, uh, your restaurant and commercial, uh, your, your, your commercial tenants, they haven't paid any rent for five months to the landlord, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what, what is your comment on that? What is, what is the reason behind all this? 
Yeah, Khalid, we, we tried to cover that a little bit earlier. That's a, that's a great issue. And I, I think that's something I was mentioning before real estate. I think there's two things happening. One, if you look at the market and we're talking about the stock market as a whole, there is a very small grouping of that that's driving the growth of the market because those sectors are doing very well. So, you know, you look at the technology industry, you look at the semiconductor industry, you look at the healthcare sector, those sectors, and there's some really good groups that I love and we have some incredible positions we utilize. That's driving almost 60% of the market, which is why the numbers are so high. The real estate market is a unique situation and I do agree with you. We haven't had a chance for the hangover to kick in. So when that inventory, when those forbearances are stopped, uh, when people start to try to evict or call on these people owing money, you're going to have a massive amount of inventory. But I do think it's going to be um, geopolitical and it's also going to geographically restricted. So you're going to have parts of the country, i.e. New York City, for example, that could have a huge hit because of certain things. But then you have other parts of the country, for example, Central Florida, where a lot of the companies never closed. They stayed open. So they provided services or they figured a way because of their location. So I do think real estate will be the next sector to take a big hit, um, um, particularly in the residential area, more so than the commercial right off the bat, because you just touched on the point that those tenants lose their jobs. Now they can't pay their rent. Now they can't pay their notes. So you're going to have that possibility. But again, I think, you know, the answer to the problem is more, more income, more opportunity. So if we continue to grow the economy back to the levels we were growing before, I really do think it's going to be a short-term issue, not a long-term one. Thank you. And thank you, Betsy, for bringing the very important subject uh, 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 related to the current situation to our attention and giving us so much knowledge. Oh, thank you, Khalid. You know that it's all my team that does all this stuff. So I appreciate you um, saying that. But we, we work as a group here. So thank you so much. Jason, you, as we Khalid. think about wrapping up, what are some things that we should be thinking about if we haven't covered them already? I, I love your sensibility yeah. about investing. I really like the optimism and I like the, the kind of show of strength. I think there's a lot of, um, uh, there is a lot of fear out there. And I really like how you said, don't let fear dictate policy. Um, and I really like your approach to this. So as we start to wrap up, what are some final parting thoughts you want to leave with us? Well, first of all, I, I make sure that you have a very educated and stable team supporting you. I think, you know, trying to invest using Google or an online app is like trying to work on yourself as a doctor using WebMD. It's not going to work. Uh, a lot of people also don't understand the difference between financial advisors and financial planners. I think that's critical. Um, people don't realize that a financial advisor technically could have been working at a fast food restaurant, taking one test, and now he's giving you advice. I'd recommend looking at financial planners as a resource. It's not a guarantee, but it does have individuals that have done four years of college, They've been immersed in finance. They've got additional accreditations. So you're gonna have people that consider this a profession. Uh, I also think that you have a plan that fits you and then execute the plan. Uh, I tell clients this all the time. You never wanna get in a situation we call paralysis by analysis. You're getting 75 opinions and everything goes on before you know it, the market's done. A good stat I'll leave you with was from 1994 to 2004, the average market advisor did about seven and a half percent. The average person, difference was fear or emotion. So having a good plan, having a good team, uh, and then looking at the long term, don't get caught up in the news cycle. Don't get caught up in the social media cycle, because those are, are, are just pictures. Those are windows in time, and they're usually very, very faint. All right. Well, we heard it here first today from Jason Edwards of Edwards Financial Solutions. Jason, if people want to get in touch with you, as we hope they do, what's mm -hmm. the best way for them to reach you? Well, they can reach us via our toll-free number, which is 1-877-678-9400. Again, it's 877-678-9400. Or go to our website, which is efs-advisors.com. efs-advisors.com. Or you could Google Jason Edwards in the Winter Park Chamber directory listing. So I missed that. I was going to say, go to the Winter Park Chamber first. Then after that, try everything else. I'll, hear, I'll be here with the assist to get you over the line. We are absolutely Great. thrilled to have your insights and really your optimism and your expertise today. Thank you for what you do for us at the Chamber. Uh, and if you want more information, you know how to find them. Winterpark.org is the Chamber directory listing, and you can find them that way or through his toll-free number, 
or the website. Jason, thank you for spending time with us today. Um, and also Tiffany's put the chamber directory listing up on the chat box. You can click straight through the directory listing and get in touch with Edwards Financial Services. Um, so we want you to continue following what we're doing on social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter, and you can subscribe to our newsletter at winterpark.org to get more information about programming like this. We do have another upcoming webinar this week. That's on Wednesday, August the 12th at 4 p.m. And unfortunately, we're hearing there's a rising demand for divorces. Maybe that's fear driving policy as well, but there's a rising demand for divorces right now. We want you to learn from the experts at the Kendrick Law Group who will be speaking to the topic divor divorce during a pandemic what you need to know. So if that's relevant to you or someone you know, make sure they join us Wednesday, August 12th at 4 p.m. To sign up, go to winterpark.org or you can follow us on Facebook Live. Thank you for being with us today and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. And again, many thanks to Jason Edwards and Edwards Financial Services. Thank you, Betsy, and thanks to the Winter Park Chamber. Great job.